Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. KGW News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Devin Haskins with KGW News. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. How do you hear me? I can hear you pretty well. Very well, actually. Great. Lovely to be talking to you today. Where, where is the... I guess uh, with the International Space Station constantly moving, can you tell me where the space station is at, at this moment? What are you guys seeing outside right now? We're starting to look around because we, uh, we need to double check. We've both been working pretty diligently all day, so we haven't looked out in the window in a few hours. We can tell you we're 400 kilometers above the Earth, and since I'm in the Navy, I like to say we're 220 nautical miles above the Earth. Works for me. This was your first trip to space. Can you walk me through your feelings and thoughts as you were launching uh, into the space, uh, up to the space station? Yeah, we had kind of a unique crew on Crew 3 Dragon headed up here to meet Mark, who's been up here already for six months. Uh, but we had three rookies on our crew, who's for, it was their first launch, and then we had Tom Marshburn, who has the distinct honor of, one of being one of the very few people to have launched on the shuttle, the Soyuz, and now the Crew Dragon, so three different vehicles. Um, I think for us, we felt really well trained. The NASA astronauts who have come before us on the Crew Dragon um, and the SpaceX training team did an awesome job preparing us. So honestly, sometimes we weren't even sure that it was real, <laughs> um, but it was just an incredible experience. The Falcon 9 is an awesome ride and we had a really smooth and nominal flight up into orbit. You were able to do your first spacewalk uh, just a couple weeks ago. Tell me what that was like. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, it was something that I was really hoping I would get the chance to do while I was aboard the space station for this mission. And so the chance to do it so early in my mission was a huge huge opportunity for me and the entire team. Uh, we were really lucky that we had a really experienced team with a lot of training opportunities before we launched. So we got the opportunity to practice it in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is the big pool where we practice spacewalks underwater. We practiced it in our virtual reality trainer. We studied it a bunch when our launch got delayed. And then we got up here and had an incredible team. So Mark and Raja suited us up. Matias and Raja did the robotics operations and we had an amazing team on the ground supporting us throughout the procedure. So everything went really smoothly and it was an incredible view. There's something really special about looking down on the earth uh, through a visor of a helmet because you don't have anything blocking your peripheral vision. When you're looking out the window up here, it's incredible, but you really know you're looking out, out a window. In the helmet, nothing's blocking your field of view, so you get a really uh, big picture. Um, Mark, do you have any memories from your first spacewalk? What you what really stuck with you? I was definitely uh, everything Kayla said. I agree with. Um, I certainly was extremely happy to have had the opportunity to do every spacewalk, but I was also very happy when I got back in and exhausted and hungry by the time I finished. I think it was uh, six hours there, five, a couple hours, more than a couple hours that you guys were out there. Um, looking at your Instagram page, Kayla, you've taken some amazing photos. Can you describe uh, from up there what a sunrise looks like?
Yeah, we love watching sunrises and sunsets up here, and we get to see one every 90 minutes or so. So there's a lot of opportunities to view them. And actually, one of my good friends asked me about what they look like from space. So that's what kind of started my project of trying to capture it in photos because I tried to describe it to her. But it's kind of incredible. The um, We call the line that differentiates between the sunlit and the shadowed part of the Earth the terminator. And so when you're over the lit part of the Earth, you can see the terminator coming into view and it just kind of passes over and slowly covers the earth and so as you're getting you know the last slice of lit earth you get kind of pastel colors like you're used to on earth but then once the sun is fully blocked by the earth you get this incredible you know sort of ombre effect from really bright orange to yellow to these really beautiful blue colors, cobalt blue and light, lighter teal blue. And you actually see the clouds lit up from an oblique angle. Um, so it's, it's a really, really cool thing to see. And we've also had a lucky period. We had, you know, kind of a unique orbit and the angle of the sun where the sunset was almost permanent for a while. <laughs> so almost any time you went in the cupola, it was really uh, beautiful colors, really lit up and you could see the, the clouds from the side, which is pretty neat. Uh, I want to talk about your time in the Navy. Um, how has life on a submarine helped you in these quarters of the uh, the ISS? I compare the time up here to a submarine all the time, and I'm always finding new parallels. I think that's probably normal for all of us to compare it to our previous experience, because those are the things that prepared us to become astronauts in the first place. Um, but for me, there's a lot of similarities from the engineering side, all the things it takes to keep human beings alive in an environment where we're not really designed to be in, whether that's the vacuum, the space or under the surface of the ocean. But the other parallels that I think are really important to me and that I rely on is the kind of team and teamwork it takes to do something like this, to send human beings into an environment where they're not normally hanging out and not only survive there, but thrive and accomplish a mission, work together. And so no one person can do something that crazy on their own. And so on the submarine, we had the whole crew with us aboard, 165 people, experts in every system. And here it's a little different in that a few of us are in space, but that team of experts is on the ground in all of our mission control centers around the world, supporting everything that we do up here. Um, so I, I rely on the lessons I learned being a member of a team aboard a submarine crew every single day as I work up here executing things uh, here for NASA and the mission aboard the space station. Mark, you're there for, on a 12-month mission. Kayla, you're there for the next uh, four, five, six months. What's your mission that... Uh, Sorry, what is your mission and what will you, uh, what will you be doing while there? We are like laboratory technicians. So the, the scientists are on the ground. We get to be their eyes and hands, primarily making sure that they have the resources they need to make, keep the experiments going. Uh, for me, this week, uh, in, or last week and this week, I installed and tore down Ring Shear Drop, which is an experiment that's associated with um, the flow and formation of amyloids. Keep a long story short, it's an experiment that takes advantage of the fact that we can contain things in space by just using surface tension. And it'll help us better understand things that might result in, in a better ability to deal with Alzheimer's disease. How did, uh, how did you guys spend Christmas? What was, uh, what was for dinner? How did uh, that holiday work up there? We had a really fantastic Christmas, actually. We were lucky that we had a cargo vehicle arrive on December 22nd, a cargo dragon. So we got a lot of fresh Christmas treats, a lot of fresh food, and some special holiday food. And we had a big Christmas Eve dinner with the entire space station crew. Our cosmonaut colleagues joined us. Uh, and then on Christmas Day, we actually had a Christmas cookie decorating contest, uh, which we invited the ground control centers around the world to judge. And actually, Mark won a few awards there. I think you won a Best in Show on the 3D Decorating Contest and a Best Space Themed on the 2D Decorating Contest. So we, we had a pretty good time, had a lot of good Christmas cheer up here. To each 
of you, why did you want to become an astronaut? Uh, I always thought being an astronaut would be an amazing thing. Never thought it would be a real possibility. Um, but the thing that always inspired me about it was this idea that we get to explore and do it in a way that benefits all of humanity. And it's a for those reasons and the fact that it's a job that com combines um, mental and physical challenges, it, it, everything about it is appealing to me. And even the fact that looking out the window helps, just gives you an opportunity to get a perspective on our existence that you don't normally get. For me, I didn't grow up dreaming specifically of becoming an astronaut. I was always looking for opportunities in sports, athletics, and eventually in joining the military that would be challenging, but also fun for me, things I was passionate about, and that I would be doing with the best team, the best people surrounding me. And so that's what took me to the Naval Academy. That's what took me to the submarine force. And it wasn't until after my time serving on a submarine that I became inspired to become an astronaut. I just happened to meet an astronaut who's also a Naval Academy graduate at an event and got the chance to talk to her and hearing her stories about assembling the space station as part of the shuttle program really inspired me because of all the parallels with what I had just got done doing aboard the submarine. And I, I think if it wasn't for that experience, wasn't for the people who surrounded me and supported me, who molded me into a young leader, who helped me develop as an engineer, I wouldn't have had the confidence to even apply in the first place, let alone dream that I would actually get it. Um, so. For me, I was just attracted to the mission, the opportunity to continue to serve, and the opportunity to be a part of the incredible team that NASA has. Uh, I remember when I was in the second grade, they asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? On my sheet of paper, it says, I want to be an astronaut. Obviously, I took a different career path, but for those kids that are out there saying, I want to be an astronaut, or maybe the young adults that are in high school right now, what would you tell them? Uh, to those saying, I want to be an astronaut? I would say find things that will push your boundaries, look for challenges, risk failure. Always be a team player, and by that I mean you should always try to do your best, but put more effort into getting the people around you to be their best than you standing out all the time as being better than other folks. So do your best, get everybody else to take everybody else along with you. The only thing I would add to that is just recognize there's no one path to becoming an astronaut. There are people who are in our office who are incredible astronauts from so many different backgrounds, so many different academic interests, so many different professional interests. And so I think something that's really important is finding things that you're passionate about and that are challenging to you, kind of like we talked about earlier. I think we've all been in situations where we've had to do things that are really hard that we also don't enjoy, and that's just no way to live your life or really to develop yourself. And so for me, it was always about finding things that I knew would be challenging, but also that I knew I would enjoy because that's just the, the right place to be in your life. And if that happens to get you to the point that you get to become an astronaut, that's fantastic. But if it doesn't, you're already doing something that you really believe in. Kayla, you're part of the Artemis mission, you know, NASA's plan to land on the moon in, uh, in a couple of years. How does this mission prepare you for that? I think there is no better possible training for Artemis and for our return to the moon than being aboard the International Space Station. We have been operating the International Space Station continuously for more than two decades now with U.S. astronauts up here every single day for the past 20 years plus. That's kind of incredible to think about. And so we have a really mature operational philosophy here. We really understand how to run the space station from mission control. We have all of these experts with tons of experience, both here in the astronaut office, but also on the ground in the mission control team. And we get to do things like do spacewalks, fix things that break, keep our environmental control system running. And so for me, I think think there's no better way to prepare, to push the boundaries, to do things we've never done before, to face challenges we can't even foresee, than to learn from that experience like I'm doing right now aboard the space station.
Mark, with your six months of experience uh, prior to Kayla showing up, what kind of advice do you give her? You know, how do you sleep? How do you take breaks? How do you mentally um, handle what you're living in? I would say the biggest piece of advice that I gave everybody, the folks, especially not Tom so much because he had been here before, was recognize that we're all going to make mistakes and uh, be really kind to yourself. So I know for me, and I know discussions with my some of my crewmates, that it's really easy when you do take a little longer on something than maybe the plan was, was just to recognize that you doing your best is really good and to, to just roll with it and try to be in the moment not stress about what's coming up and focus on what you're doing all the time and try to find ways to enjoy it. Also, um, certainly for me as a philosophy with treating the folks that just arrived is to recognize that they have spent years training for this. And even though sometimes they will feel like, gosh, I can't believe I made that mistake, they are the highest trained people we can get up here. And just to recognize that and the, the great respect that everybody has for everybody else on the team. Are you guys able to talk with your family up there, kind of have uh, regular conversations, you know, whether it's uh, over a Skype conversation or something like that? I'm curious to know how that works, how you contact home. Yeah, we are actually really lucky, especially compared to what we experienced on, you know, for Mark on his Army deployments and me on my Navy deployments. Uh, we actually have an Internet protocol phone that we can use through our laptops, so as long as we have good satellite coverage, we can call uh, any number. People can't call us, but we can call them. Um, and then we also have at least once a week, we have a video chat with our families where we get to, you know, actually see them and hear them. Um, so we're, we're able to stay in pretty good contact with our family back home. Oh, that's fun. I, I, Kayla, I just talked with your, uh, your mom yesterday and was asking for uh, some pictures of you during your time. And she says uh, she needs to get permission from you. So I'm wondering if you have some pictures that you can give her permission to, to send me and, uh, you know, that you'd be willing to, uh, to have out there. You can, you can tell she's well-trained. I'm glad that was her answer. Yeah, I'll check in with her and make sure we get you some photos. <laughs> All right. To the both of you, thank you so much. Technology to me is amazing, the fact that my voice is in space and I'm able to talk with you guys. I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to, uh, to talk with me uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome talking with you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants from KGW News Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.